Hey, today we're really uh, highlighting Next Gen, and if you saw, we had a couple youth on the worship team, and we also had all the kids here singing. And I just want you to know something. Um, we as a church, we need to rally around our young people. They're not the church of tomorrow. They're the ter- church of today. And we need to rally around them. They are faced with a lot of things that a lot of us didn't face as much when we were in school. Um, and we need to be the biggest supporters of teenagers and young people. And I have found this, and I'm not saying that you are this way. I have found that as I've gotten older, I have been a little bit more set in my ways and less open to seeing new ways. Um, but next gen, um, you know, there's some things that, that some of our young adults and young people, that God's going to use them in different ways. That's not going to be the same of how it was when we were younger. And we just need to embrace them and encourage, equip, and empower them. That's our vision. So we're going to talk today with um, Pastor Shea, who's our next-gen pastor, um, overseas kids and youth, and just walk through um, the importance of next-gen. So talk to us a little bit about the importance of next-gen, and then uh, we'll bring it home as far as how we can help on Sundays later. Yeah, so like Pastor Scott said, um, this is not like an up-and-coming generation. Next-gen is really a term that's It's nice and easy to say because it's not our generation, right? It's the next generation after us. Um, But they're really the now generation. They are right now. They are um, leading their schools. They're leading their friends. They're leading church. I mean, we saw them up here. Um, We have kids who are constantly wanting to serve. So they are a value. And that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit today is how the Lord views this generation. And it's that they're so valued. We have got to value this generation, the way that the Lord does. A lot of the times it's like, oh, they're just kids. If you really want to get on my nerves, tell me that they're just a kid, and then we will have some words, because they're not just kids. They are kids. I mean, we're called to be like them, right? It says in the word that if you have faith like a child, you will enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, And so I want to real quick in um, 2 Kings, I think it is, yeah, 2 Kings 22 verses 1 through 2 talks about King Josiah. King Josiah was eight years old. Now, he was not appointed as an eight-year-old. His dad died, and so he was eight years old when his dad died, and they said, great, now you are king. Um, But it didn't matter to them that he was eight years old. And it went on in verse two. What it says about King Josiah is it says, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor, David. He did not turn away from doing what's right. And I just want to like communicate a lot of the times we think like, hey, mom, dad, I felt like Jesus told me this today. Oh, that's great. Like, take it. King Josiah was eight years old, and he knew what would please the Lord. He heard the Lord speak to him and said, I'm going to do what will honor the Lord. I'm going to do what will honor the people that came before me. Right? There's no such thing as the junior Holy Spirit. Right? There is just the Holy Spirit. He is the same. The same Holy Spirit that's in Pastor Scott is in me, is in you, is in Emmy Lou, is in Nolan, is in from age to age to age. He is the same. There is no dumbed down version of him. So he'll speak the same thing to you when you're struggling through something that he will to a kid who is struggling through something. They can hear his voice and quite honestly, I think most of the time can hear his voice a little bit easier than us because they still have that innocence. They have that wonder. They have that I will be so quick to trust Jesus because that's what the Bible says. That's what my parents, that's what my pastor, that's what my leaders tell me is that I can trust him. So why would I not trust him? So our kids and our students and our young adults, they hear from the Lord. So when they share something with you, hey, I felt like Jesus has told me this. I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke this over my life. Continue that conversation with them. Dive deeper with them and that. Take them at their word with that. In Matthew, if we flash forward to the New Testament, that's really where Jesus begins to dive in to his disciples and the people listening. Hey, kids are a value to me. In Matthew 19, um, Jesus is doing a message on marriage. He's just talking about marriage, you know, doing a teaching. And a bunch of parents bring all their kids up to go sit at his feet and continue learning from him, probably because these parents are like, well, this guy's Jesus. We want them to hear from him what is the right way to live? What's the right way to be in relationship with people? 
um, Jesus' best friends, their first reaction is it says they, um, like, basically scold the parents for bringing their kids up to sit at Jesus' feet. And Jesus is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let them come to me. Like, let them sit here. Let them learn from me. And honestly, good on those parents for bringing them up to him so that they could learn more from him. So all that to say, this generation is a value to the Lord. He is moving. I mean, just in our youth camps alone this past year, we had the biggest youth summer camp that I don't know how long it's been since we had a summer camp of over 300 just teenagers. There were still leaders and camp staff, but there were over 300 teenagers at our camp. There's been over three to 400 at camps out in California. There was over 300 in the New England region this summer. Guys, God is moving among our young people, and we have to pray for that. We have to continue to say, Lord, have your way in this generation, because this generation needs, they need a move of God more than ever before. And because they know I'm valued in the sight of the Lord, guys, we should be coming alongside of them and saying, hey, but we also value you. I value you. I see you for who you are. So value this generation. It's so, so, so important. Amen. That's good. The next day, if you have your notes, you can, you can follow with us. But, you know, if we understand that God values young people, and we're talking, when we say young, we're not just talking teenagers. We're talking kids. You know, like she said, eight-year-old king. Wouldn't that be weird? What if we had an election next year and, and one of them was eight? You were like, that's how, that's how you would have to think about that. Um, but at the same time, we have to get past our stuff sometimes that causes us to see a young person or a teenager and already have a filter of what we think they're like because of how we would see a generation or because of what we have seen in generational stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and so the second thing, the second thing in your notes is we got to believe in them. You know, I'm giving you the example of David. We won't go through all the scriptures, but in the first passage there of uh, 1 Samuel 16, you can read it on your own in verse 1 through 13. This is where Samuel is told by the Lord to go anoint one of Jesse's kids as the next king. So he goes and he tells Jesse, I want you to bring all your sons out. One of them is going to be the next king. And he gets all the sons and he puts all the sons out. And Samuel goes to the first one, and everybody thinks, including Samuel, that this, is, this must be him. He's good looking. He's tall. He's, he's the oldest. I mean, you know, he was, he was what everybody thought. This is going to be the next king. And it wasn't. And they kept going down the line, and then none of them. So Samuel said, Did, do you have another son? Like, is this it? He goes, oh, yeah, there's David. This is my paraphrase. paraphrase. Oh, yeah, there's David. He's, he's out in the, in the fields tending sheep. And Sam was like, well, go get him. So put yourself in David's shoes. He says, one of your sons is the next king. Yeah. Well, I'm going to get them all, but David, it's probably not David. We'll leave him out in the field. Now, I'm not saying that he felt that, but I'm saying he very easily could have felt that he wasn't believed in because he was young and just a shepherd, shepherd boy, that he wasn't fit. Mm-hmm. And that would, that would have been a filter that Jesse had to say, okay, it's probably one of these. Because everybody thought it was going to be the oldest, the biggest, the strongest, all that. So he already, here's David already like, you know, it's like the one was like when you're trying to pick teams for kickball or something. And the last person there, you're like, okay, I guess I'll take them. You know, you know that feeling when you're the last one picked and even then they're not excited about picking you. It's like, well, we have to have one more. So we'll take them. That's kind of, I could see David feeling that way. Um, because he was young. So when you look at the scriptures, you think David could have easily felt that there were some things there that, that could have hurt him, could have made him feel not valuable. Well, then you go to chapter 17, and now his brothers are fighting in this battle against the Philistines. His brothers are out there, and Jesse sends David with some food. And if you go to chapter 17, we can put up verse uh, 28 and 29. David's oldest brother, Eliab heard David talking to the men, and he was angry because David was finding out, hey, what's going on? And he was talking about Goliath is talking trash and, you know, wanting this, you know, someone to come fight him. And uh, he said, what are you doing around here anyway, he demanded, talking to David. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to, 
You just want to see the battle. What have I done now, David replied. I was only asking a question. So David's just trying to figure out, like, what's going on? He's like, go take care of the sheep, boy. Pride, deceitful. Like, imagine that here's his brothers are treating him this way, feeling like he's not valuable and he's not important. You keep going into that. You go to verse 32 and 33, and it says, don't worry about the Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul. So now the king is saying to David, uh, excuse me, little man, but you're not going to go fight him. Like, what are you talking about? So we have his, his dad, his brothers, now the king, his authority, that all do not see the potential that God sees in David. He says, there's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. In other words, because you're only a boy, you can't. And that's what we have to, we have to get past the because you're a teenager, because you're a kid, you can't. That's not true. That's not true. And uh, he said he's been a man of war since his youth. He's talking about this big old giant who's been a man of war for a long time. And he's saying, listen, you can't do this. And then verse 40, 41 through 44, now David, he goes out there. He decides he's going he's gonna to fight him anyway. And he goes out there, and Goliath walks toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. And then he says this, am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the name of his gods. He said, come over here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals. So here's Goliath, again, talking trash to this little boy, saying, why are they sinning? You're the best that they have. Little guy, you're the best, and you don't even have armor, and you don't even have, all you have is this little sling. Well, what happens? Goliath gets taken out by this little boy. First shot. <laughs> First shot, David was like, hey, I'm coming at you in the name of the Lord. And then not only takes him down and cuts his head off, right in front of all the army. David knew how to get ahead in life. I'm just kidding. That's a joke. <laughs> so I know that was horrible. That's I the should point not of next gen it. Sunday. <laughs> um, we can edit that out. Uh, but here was the thing. This is what I want you to get. David had to go walk through his father not really thinking he had it. His brothers not really thinking. His authority over him not believing he could. And then the enemy he was facing not believing he could. But I'm going to tell you something. When, when God says yes, it doesn't matter what everybody else says. So when Shay talks earlier about God saying, let these children come to me. Let them. There's, there, there's something pure about young people. Uh-huh. And some young people have gotten, they're not, they're not way out there, but, but you know what? They want genuine, real. And, and we have to be more sensitive to, to what's going on in the lives of young people and to believe in them and not have our pre, preconceived ideas of what we think about them, especially based on what they look like or what they dress like or whatever. So we want to make sure that we believe in them and then the third thing is, how do we empower them? I do want to read this passage to you in uh, 1 Samuel 18, and then we'll turn it back to, to Shay. 1 Samuel 18, it says, after David finished talking with Saul, so now David is, you know, with Saul. Obviously, now Saul's all, you know, hey, David, you're the man. When earlier Saul was like, you little boy, you can't do that. Um, But he met Jonathan, the king's son, and there was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. So Saul really appreciated David, wanted David around. Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David, together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So here you have the king that is now saying, okay, uh, you can do things. And so now he's given him stuff to do. Saul made, a commander over, Saul made him a commander over the men of war as a young person, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. 
it's amazing how you, when you do something like what David did, now all the officers are like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, David, I mean, he took Goliath out. And uh, so when the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. So listen, David is seeing more success than Saul. This made Saul angry. Everybody say, turn to your neighbor and say, don't be a Saul. What's this? He said, the credit David, they credit David with ten thousands and me only thousands. They'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day, but Saul had a spear in his hand. And he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped twice. Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. So here's, here's what I want you to see. We have to be, we have to make sure that we do not become Saul's. We have to let this younger generation thrive. We got to give them opportunities to sing. And what if they sing better than us or to play instruments? What if they play better than us or to speak? What if they speak better than us? What if we have them, you know, do something and they do it better than us, that we celebrate it, that we don't get jealous because, you know, that can hold people to a place where we don't, we don't, um, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. You feel, you feel me right? That, that, right there. We that. don't, like, we delegate to them and we empower them. That's the word I'm looking for. I should have just turned around. We empower them to be all that God's called them to be. And we watch them shine and we celebrate them. We celebrate them from babies all the way up, all the way up till they're in college as far as next year. And we celebrate adults out of college too. But I'm just saying, we celebrate this generation as they're growing and as they're maturing and in their journey because people need people around them that will support them. And that's what we need to do. Yeah, so um, I'm a product of that. I just want to... we. Didn't talk about this, but I promise this is good. <laughs> I'm not going to go off the rails. Um, but I'm a product of knowing I'm valued, being believed in, and being empowered from the time I was a kid on. My parents, every single Sunday, we'd come home from church. Hey, what did God speak to you today during church? It wasn't, hey, what did you learn? What did you learn during church? It was, what did God say to you? Telling me, oh, I know how to hear God's voice. Hey, what stood out to you from what you learned in class today? Or what stood out to you when, from your small group discussion? When I, um, in California, sixth grade is still elementary school. And so when I graduated from sixth grade and was a junior higher, immediately that summer, which was one month later, I started serving at kids camp because I knew I could be a leader and be 11 years old still. Even though I had just come from kids ministry, I could still lead even though I was 11. And then going into high school, I was 16 years old and begged our four-square four district, hey, can I please serve at youth camp? I know I'm a youth student. I'll go to the one that my youth group is going to. But there were like two or three other camps happening. And I just wanted to serve because all my life I had leaders. I had our next gen director at that time pouring into me, my parents, my youth pastor, my kids pastors, always telling me, hey, you can lead right where you're at. You are called and you are equipped right now. So start now. And that's why I believe that I'm the way that I am because I know that my whole life I've known I can lead. It doesn't matter how old I am. It doesn't matter when I was five years old or it didn't matter when I was 16 years old. It doesn't matter that I'm 26 years old. I still know that I can lead and I'm called to. And so that's, that's why I'm so passionate about Next Gen because these kids, I gave my life to the Lord when I was three years old. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was five years old. And I believe that that same thing can happen for these kids, right? There's this um, guy, his name's Greg Johnson. He leads this ministry called J12, all about learning about what Jesus was like when he was 12 years old, when 
you know, Joseph and Mary go and find him in the temple. And he's like, didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? I must be about my father's business at 12 years old. And the whole kind of campaign slogan type thing for J-12, it's been around a very long time. I did J-12 when I was a tween, 11. Um, But Greg Johnson, he says, we have got to reach a generation before they need to be rescued. And guys, we are standing up against a culture and a world that is coming against our kids and setting us up to have to rescue them. But our God, the kingdom of God, it it prevails. He prevails. So we have to reach them before they have to be rescued. So talk to our kids. If you see a kid running around in the hallway, hey, what's your name? Hey, are you excited for school this year? What, what, do you know your teacher yet? Do you know what's your favorite subject? What sport do you like to play? What do you want to be when you grow up? Talk with them. Just take a couple minutes. And guys, that speaks a lot to kids and to teenagers when you take a minute to just get to know them, especially remembering their name. Have y'all ever talked to a kid or a teenager and been like, hey, Sean, and then you see their eyes light up like, you know my name. Doesn't it make you feel good when someone knows your name? And you've like met them once or twice? Get to know our kids because when you get to know them, they're going to know, oh, they value me. When you get to know their interests, they're going to know, oh, they believe in me. And then we can start saying, hey, why don't, why don't you sit back there and help us run the slides this morning? We're empowering them. We're getting them ready to be launched into the world and do all that God's created them to do and be all who God's created them to be. So, I don't know. I just, I love me some this generation. I don't know about y'all, but I really, really love them. That's why we brought you here. <laughs> we all love them, but you are definitely passionate about it. Good job. Shay, like I remember your name. Wow. Thank you Does so that much. Bless you? I feel really Good. valued right now by my senior pastor slash boss. <laughs> um, listen, how do we practically do this as a church? I'm going to give you a few things, and then you feel free to share some things as well. We as a church, the number one thing is pray. Pray for young people. You, you know, A lot of you, you... Some of you have little babies. Start praying now. You should be praying now. Train them up in the ways of the Lord. And then also as they, as you know, when you're here and, you know, in, in the classroom, when they're back in the classroom, um, man, they're hearing the word. So follow up as parents. Follow up with them. Talk to them as Shay was saying. Her parents would be like, hey, what did God speak to you? Uh, so pray, praying is a big thing. To just pray for young people. You can do that anywhere you are. You can pray. The other, th- uh, uh, another thing that you can do is our, our, um, we are a very relational church, and we take time every Sunday to greet. And it, it it's easy to get into the habit of just greeting the people that you know the most or that are right there around you. But look for young people. Look for young people to get to know them, to, 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 like, just strike up conversation with them. You know, connection is a big deal. Relationships are a big deal to young people. Um, and even though I'm not, I would consider myself super young, I'm still young in my eyes. Um, and relationships are important to me. Uh, so I think we can, we can do stuff there. There's, there's ways of even practically when it comes to, um, like, they just had camp. I've made a commitment. Our church council has made a commitment. Youth will never miss out on anything because of money. So we will help. We will support. We will pay for. We will scholarship. Uh, we'll raise money as a church. We're not going to have our church. Listen, I told Shay, you are not going to do any car washes and fundraisers. We will support your youth ministry because that's, that's what we're going to do. We're not going to make them pay their, figure out how to somehow earn their way to a camp where they're going to hear about God all week long, and it'll change their life. We're going to do that. We're going to make investments in our youth ministry. When we want to change things up as far as classrooms or the way things look, we are going to do that as a church. We are paying. We are supporting. So anything that goes on with youth, and when you hear announcements, if you ever want to help or scholarship something or someone for camp, um, those are opportunities that we can just come behind and say, hey, we got you. And we want to make this investment in you. Uh, so those are other ways. And I would, I'll just say this one thing, and then I'm going to turn it to you. Our, our kids' ministry is called E4 Kids' Ministry because the vision of all of our ministries is the same. The youth vision is embrace, encourage, equip, and empower youth. 
The kids' vision, embrace, encourage, equip, and empower kids. Women's ministry, embrace, encourage, equip, and empower women. You got, you got it? What do you think the men's ministry is? Like five of you know it, you guys. Perfect. Come on. Come on. Perfect. <laughs> so if we all know that that's what it is, then that's what E4 is. So here's, what, here's our heart, that even as young children in the nursery, we embrace them. We're loving on them. When they get a little bit older into E2, we're encouraging them in things of the Lord, but even practically things, just practical. Hey, you're growing up. Good job. You know, they're, some of them are, you know, potty training. Some are going through stuff. You can encourage them there. Like, hey, you got this. Oh, you didn't. Go get your mom. Like, you know, <laughs> but either way, we're helping. And then as they get older, then we start equipping them. When they're in second, third grade, we're equipping them to do things. And then when they get to the fifth grade, sixth grade, fifth grade especially, we're empowering them. There's no reason why we can't have young people running cameras, running a computer, helping on the worship team. And we're going to be more intentional about that. So young people that are here, listen, anything you want to get involved in, talk to us. Because we want to get you involved and get you plugged in. And uh, we want to make room for you. Because you are Thrive. That's who you are. And, uh, and we're proud of you. We're proud that you're here. We're proud of what God is doing in your life. And we have made a commitment and are making a commitment that we embrace and encourage equipment and power. Every, every person that walks in this building, no matter what age, no matter, no matter what's going on in their life, we embrace them. And um, so those are just some practical things that we just need to remember as a church that we are here to do it. Especially, I want to I wanna talk to some of the older generation, and I say that, you can pick what's old, it doesn't matter, older than the youth. But you have wisdom. You have experience. You have experienced life. It would be wonderful for you on a, on a Sunday when you're standing outside to, to encourage someone about, you know, I remember when I was your, or whatever, just even those kind of things are very encouraging mm-hmm. to young people. Mm-hmm. There's still, you can still minister to young people no matter how old you are, no matter where you are in life. You can still, you can still minister. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's, um, just real quick, there is actually, I would just want to piggyback off of that. Um, there's a passage in Judges 2, and it talks about, um, it says something in there like, and there was a generation that grew up not knowing the things of the Lord, not knowing the things that he had done. This generation needs you guys to share your stories of what God has done in your life so that they know when they walk through similar things, oh, wait, but I actually had a conversation with Butch and Joanne, and they shared about when God did this in their lives. So I can trust him to do the same thing for me. Because this generation is in jeopardy of becoming a Judges 2 generation if we don't start sharing the things that the Lord has done in our lives and how he has transformed us. Um, But real quick, another way, you guys probably know this is coming, but another way that you um, can invest in this generation is by getting plugged in and serving on Sundays in kids, on Sunday nights at youth, on Wednesdays in kids' small groups. Y'all, they're are so many times where I have walked away from serving like, dang, that rocked me. Just on Wednesday night, our kids were talking, and they were all talking about how, yeah, so I was trying to tell my friend at school about Jesus, or I was trying to read my Bible with my friend at school, or, yeah, this kid on my sports team, I was talking with them about Jesus, and I'm really trying. They're kind of resistant, but I'm going to keep trying. And I was sitting there thinking like, dang, when was the last time I tried to tell somebody about Jesus? And quite honestly, I couldn't tell you the last time I tried to tell one of my friends who doesn't know the Lord or a grocery store clerk or, you know, a bank teller. I can't remember the last time I tried to tell somebody about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit really convicted me like, hey, these kids, they're trying to tell people about me. And so for me, that was like, I mean, I'm back there with them. I haven't been for the past couple months, but I'm back there with them almost every single week. How can I be leading them when they're actually, I mean, on Wednesday night, they led me to that place. The Holy Spirit used them to lead me there. On Sunday mornings, we have kids who will write response cards during ministry time saying, Lord, thank you for leading me all of my life. Eight years old. Thank you for leading me all of my life. Another kid has written, God, help me share more about you. Help me share more about you. Kids get nervous to share about Jesus too. It's not just us. I've had deep conversations with, hey, 
if God knew everything, why did he allow this to happen? Or why did he create this? Guys, these kids are wanting to learn. And I learn so much by being with them every single Sunday. I'm not saying you need to be in there every single Sunday if you're going to learn something from them. But there's just, there's so many ways that you can get plugged in, in serving in kids or in youth. And y'all, there's nothing like seeing those light bulb moments of when a teenager or of when a child gets something and it's like, oh, that makes sense. That's why Jesus said it. Real quick, there was this one Sunday morning, um, one of our boys, we were doing the parable of the um, sower, I think it was, something like that. Or... It's the parable about the guy who hires the people at different times of the day to come and work for him, okay? So the one guy comes in the morning, one guy comes in the afternoon, one guy comes at the end of the day. They all get paid the same thing. So D, one of the best kids leader, she's amazing. We also have other kids leaders in here, and you are also the best. Um, But she was, I promise you, I love you all, (laughs) truly. Um, But our kids were acting it out, and the kid who was pretending to be the one working at the beginning of the day, they had each gotten a prize, and they all got the same prize. And the kid who was working all day, he goes, that's not fair. I've been working all day. Why did they get something, and they've only been here for an hour? And D goes, exactly the point Jesus was trying to make. (laughs) It doesn't matter if you've been walking with the Lord all your life or walking with him for a year. You're going to get the same reward. Um, And so seeing that moment of like, hey, that's not fair. And that exactly, that's the point Jesus is trying to make. And he was like, oh, oh, I get it now. I get it. He was kind of like a little bit embarrassed. Like, I can't believe I just reacted that way. But y'all, there's so many ways that you can pour into this generation here. And we need you to do it. We need you. If you have any desire to get get plugged in with youth or kids ministry, uh, please see Pastor Shay today. And uh, she can get the process going. It does, you do, it does require a background check because we are also about making sure that we're aware of who's back there with our kids and doing our best to keep everybody safe. You can also fill out a form on our church app or our website. Yes. There's a serving form. Good call. Um, One other thing, and we'll pray and close out, and then we'll give some instructions about the back-to-school bash for those who are staying. Um, I remember a while back, this was probably a couple years ago, there was a, a kid that came up, and I was like, hey, I haven't seen you in a little while. And here's what they said. Yeah, my parents, they didn't want to come. And, uh, or they were tired or something. He was talking about the week before. My parents were tired. And, and I know, listen, don't get me wrong. I know there's moments, you know, you get in middle of the night traveling, whatever. But I am saying this, um, that as a parent, especially with your kids, make the priority for, you, you know, don't, don't let it be inconvenient for you if it means that getting them here. If they want to be here and you want them to be here, then you know what? There might be some Sunday nights or Sunday mornings where you're like kind of tired, but your kids really want to come and hear the and be in kids ministry and get the word and do all that. Then make that extra effort to push through for them because that's who we're talking about. At times, it's going to require us to sacrifice to make sure that our kids and youth are getting what they need um, consistently. And for some, you know, you need to be doing this at home but for some, you know, this could be the really only time they're really getting the word. Mm-hmm. And uh, I hope it's not. I hope you're giving them the word at home, too. But, um, but this, this is the time for them. So uh, I would just encourage you as parents to uh, encourage your kids to be a part of things. Um, so we're going to close out in prayer. I do want to ask anyone that is currently working with kids ministry or youth ministry, will you just stand real quick? If you help at all in the kids and youth area, even sign in all that stuff. Would you just stand real quick? Can we just these thank people, all of these people for all that they do? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And parents, we're, we're partnering with you. I've made this clear to Pastor Shay. She is not responsible to raise your kids. She's responsible to partner with you in the spiritual and emotional and even physical development of your kids. She will help, but hopefully she's just reinforcing things that you're teaching at home. So if you need any help, resources, please reach out to her um, uh, because she wants to help you um, with with, uh, the spiritual direction and help of your children. All right? We good? All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for our time. God, I thank you for Pastor Shay. I thank you, Lord, for her heart, for this next generation, Lord, for youth and for kids. 
God, I pray that you just continue to speak to her, give her wisdom and direction, Lord, and as she, as she leads. Lord, we thank you for every young person that is uh, part of Thrive. God, we pray that you uh, strengthen them, that you bless them. Lord, that you reveal yourself to them consistently in new ways and fresh ways. We thank you, Lord, that we would see young people that um, grow up and stay the course and uh, continue to serve you all the days of their life. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us as a church, even individually. Lord, give us wisdom on how we can uh, play a part of supporting our next-gen ministry, supporting young people, and uh, Lord, even just today committing to pray for those every day this year of school that we commit to pray and support. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that we would we would do that in um, in new, fresh ways that you give us. Lord, that we wouldn't just walk past the teenager on a Sunday without saying something. Uh, Lord, help us to do that. And Lord, help us um, get rid of those filters we may have that when we see young people, we see a group of young people somewhere, we automatically assume there's something going on that there shouldn't be. Lord, help us to uh, to see people through your eyes. And uh, so, Lord, I just thank you for that. We give you praise. We give you thanks for all you're doing, and we, we're grateful for... Uh, Che and Sean leading, uh, and we just thank you for blessing them and their family. In Jesus' name, amen.